Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We are continuing with our fine tuning of the universe lecture series. This is now lecture 15, and the title of this lecture is The Magic of Carbon Synthesis. As you know, we are carbon based life forms. We will probably have more to say about carbon later on, but suffice it to say that without carbon being made, in stars, we would not be here to speculate on the fine tuning of the universe. And the story of the discovery of the magic of carbon synthesis is one of the most famous examples of fine tuning, and it is a perfect segue for us into our next topic, which is the forces of nature. Let us just put things in a little bit of perspective so that we see where this topic kind of fits into our general scheme. As you remember, we are discussing fine tuning in terms of the physical laws of nature. And we said that every law of nature has certain elements. There's the form of the law, the mathematical equation, and the law usually describes how forces affect material particles. And in the law, there are constants of nature, sort of like the gravitational constant, which measures the strength of the force of gravity, and masses of the fundamental particles. Also within a physical law, there are initial conditions. How are those particles starting out for the physical law to use the forces to make them move or do something else. So at the beginning of our lecture series, we talked a lot about initial conditions, particularly the initial conditions of the Big Bang and how they had to be just right to produce a life-bearing universe. After that, we talked about the extreme fine-tuning of the masses of fundamental particles. That was a perfect sort of opportunity to cover a harder topic, which is the Higgs boson. And we spent a few lectures talking about the Higgs boson, and I hope you were able to stay with us for that, because I know we went into some depth there, and that's why most elementary discussions avoid it. What is left? Well, just like the initial conditions had to be essentially perfectly fine-tuned, and the masses of the fundamental particles had to be initially fine-tuned for life to exist, it turns out that the strengths of the fundamental forces are also incredibly fine-tuned. And a perfect beginning point to see that is the so-called magic of carbon synthesis. So that's where this fits in. It is the introduction to our discussion of the fine tuning of the strengths of fundamental forces. Okay, before we go on, let us ground our discussion in Quran with the verses that we have reviewed multiple times before. Because people sometimes say, well, this is all science, where's the Quran? Well, there is not a specific Quranic verse about the um, intricacies of carbon synthesis. However, I do think that this is very, very Quran pertinent and Islam pertinent to appreciate the big picture which the Quran lays out about the creation. And the firmament he has raised high and he has set up the balance of justice and as I mentioned, and God knows best, I believe that this is not just talking about the balance of justice, but the balance of physical creation, the balance of the parameters that need to make this universe what it is. And this is perhaps more explicitly evident in the second verse from Surah Al-Qamar, إِنَّ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَنَاهُ بِقَدَرٍ Verily, all things we have created in proportion and measure. And the purpose of this series is to see how fine-tuned that measure is and 
to get a sense of what it is that is being measured. The strength of gravity, the rate of expansion of the early universe, the mass of the quark, up quark versus down quark, etc. All of these are the various parameters and the fine tuning of the universe really underscores that these things have been created um, in exquisite measure. And without that exquisite, exquisite measure, we would not exist. And so this is how this sort of material is Quran relevant, even when there is not a specific verse, the way there are verses, for example, about embryology. Um, I do think that Muslims in general, or maybe that's too broad, Muslims who have some interest in science more specifically, um, can really feel that uh, this material is relevant to our Quranic understanding. And I know for myself, it makes me appreciate these verses in a very different way, uh, rather than just as a gestalt or, or a very general statement, knowing the specifics, at least so, some of the specifics. We as humans, of course, are very limited in our knowledge, but knowing some of the specifics of what is being measured and precisely how um, delicate uh, 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 the proportion and the measure are, uh, I know, gives me a different flavor of these verses, and I hope it, it does the same for you. Okay, so as I said, we are now moving into the area of the delicate balance and the fine tuning of the fundamental forces that we know about in the universe. When we talked about the standard model, of course, we spent most of the time talking about the masses of the fundamental particles like the up quark, down quark, and the electron. But when we got to talking about the Higgs boson, we certainly touched on the particles that are the force carriers. And in that discussion, we did get to mention that there's a strong nuclear force, an electromagnetic force, a weak nuclear force. And um, these, the strength of these forces, and what is missing from here, of course, is gravitation. And we talked a little bit about that, uh, obviously, when we talked about um, the initial conditions uh, of the Big Bang. Um, but these are the four fundamental forces of nature. Here they are in a different diagram, perhaps a little bit easier to kind of tease them apart. The strong force, which binds the nucleus, the electromagnetic force, which binds atoms together. Um, and um, so that is the force that binds the electrons to the nucleus. And it is the force that underlies chemical bonds. Uh, two hydrogens joining an oxygen to make water. That is the electromagnetic force. So it binds atoms and molecules. The weak nuclear force, which is involved in radioactive decay, and of course, the gravitational force. So those are the four fundamental forces of nature. And it turns out that, of course, we don't govern how strong these forces are. Uh, we don't govern how strongly two one kilogram masses one meter apart attract each other. That is the fundamental gravitational force built into the universe. We don't govern how strongly one proton attracts an electron, that is the electromagnetic force. This is woven into the fabric of the universe. And the strength of these fundamental forces turns out to be truly fine-tuned as well. And we will begin our journey um, in this fine-tuning arena with a very, very specific and focused application uh, that we will come to next, inshallah. Okay, so with that prelude, let's talk a little bit about the magic of carbon synthesis. So, carbon is essential. All of life on our planet is carbon-based. Carbon is the backbone of life. And carbon is made in stars. It is part of so-called stellar nucleosynthesis. And when these stars explode uh, via supernova or supernovae, 
carbon, oxygen, and other heavier elements spill out into the interstellar dust, and then these become part of things like our planet Earth and get incorporated into life. So no carbon, no life as we know it. And it turns out that the synthesis of carbon in stars is a very complex and delicate process. We've already talked about how um, stars have basically hydrogen, burn hydrogen to helium. And so helium is made uh, in stars and was also made in the Big Bang uh, such that it is helium-4, means it has four nucleons. Every helium atom has two protons and two neutrons. Now, carbon is carbon-12 mostly. It is the common isotope of carbon. And if you were to count, it has six protons and six neutrons. So we can see that if we were to take three helium atoms, they would give us precisely the right number of nucleons to make a carbon-12 atom. Two protons, two neutrons, two protons, two neutrons, two protons, two neutrons, give us the six protons and six neutrons of carbon. So um, a physicist and astronomer named Fred Hoyle, he uh, was uh, at the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge University for most of his career. Uh, he sort of put this together. How does this work? Well, in stars, first two helium atoms join together to form beryllium-8. As you can see, beryllium-8 will then have four protons and four neutrons. And then if this beryllium-8 is joined by another helium atom, it will make carbon-12. So that seems like, well, conceptually pretty simple. Two helium atoms get together, form a beryllium atom, and then the beryllium gets hit by another helium atom, joins with that, and makes carbon. But beryllium-8 survives for only 10 to the minus 17th seconds. So that is just a little bit longer than a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second. Extremely short-lived. When calculations were done to see, does it make sense that something this short-lived, would there be enough time for this to hang around, get hit by a helium atom, make carbon to produce the carbon that we see? And Fred Hoyle realized that no, for carbon to exist in the amounts that we see it and, and produce life, there had to be some special conditions to facilitate this sort of reaction happening. The odds of three helium atoms colliding together in the same space at the same time to immediately make a carbon-12 are totally negligible. That would be almost physically impossible. The root is two helium atoms collide, make a beryllium, and the beryllium collides with another helium to make a carbon, but without some special, say, inducements to this reaction to make it go fast and efficiently, it also would be too unlikely to make enough carbon. So what is this sort of special inducement that Fred Hoyle deduced? What did he think of? How would this work? Since three helium atoms colliding to make a carbon-12 is out of the question, he figured it has to be two heliums making a beryllium, the beryllium joining with helium to make a carbon, but there has to be some um, special facilitation of this reaction to make the amount of carbon that we see. Okay, so this boost that we're talking about has to do with a concept known as nuclear energy levels. Here's a diagram of the energy levels of nickel a nickel nucleus. The important take-home point here is that 
In the ground state, in the natural unexcited state, we call that the zero energy of the nucleus. If the nucleus absorbs energy and becomes so-called excited, it can have an energy state up here, or if it absorbs even more energy here, or some higher energy levels up here. These are the natural energy levels of the nickel nucleus based on quantum mechanical laws and rules. The nucleus can't exist in whatever energy level it wants. It can't, for example, exist here. It can either be here or here. These are the natural energy levels of the nickel nucleus. And when the excited nucleus goes from one energy level to another, it gives off energy and would give off a gamma ray of a given strength depending on the transition. So a transition from level four plus to two plus will give us this gamma ray. A transition from here to the ground state would give us a gamma ray of this strength and so on. The take home point is that nuclei by the laws of quantum mechanics have only certain set natural energy levels in which they can exist. They cannot exist in whatever energy level they want. This is an illustration of that principle in nickel, but that principle applies to any and all nuclei, and each nucleus would have its own natural energy levels. They would not have the same energy levels as the nickel nucleus, for example. So that is the take home point. Nuclei have natural energy levels. Okay, so now that we have talked about the notion of nuclei having well defined natural energy levels that differ from nucleus to nucleus we want to now talk about this idea of resonance. What does that mean? Well, when we were looking at the notion that a helium nucleus can join a beryllium nucleus to make a carbon, we said that left to its own, that would proceed too slowly. It needs a special boost because maybe the nuclei would just bounce off each other. Why would they stick together to make a new uh, element. And so it turns out that if we have two nuclei coming together, they each have their own natural energy levels. Then they have some kinetic energy of motion. And when they hit each other, if when you add up all of these energies, they are close to, but not above, but not greater than, a natural energy level of the compound nucleus, that reaction will proceed quickly. So let's say I have a beryllium nucleus, which has its energy levels, and a helium nucleus, which has its own natural energy level. They come at each other with some kinetic energy of motion. Why kinetic energy of motion? Because they're, for example, in the core of a star, it's very hot and so they're moving quickly, and they smash into each other. If that total energy is close to a natural energy level of what would be the compound nucleus, that creates a phenomena called resonance, and that can boost this reaction rate many, many, many times from what it would be, uh, close to maybe even a thousand times, what it would be without this phenomena of resonance without this target nucleus having a natural energy level close to the combined energies. Um, if the combined energies are above the natural energy level, then that reaction will not go. It cannot be facilitated or boosted. So for resonance to take place, the combined energies have to be at or a little bit below a natural energy level of the target compound nucleus. And this phenomena of resonance, you can understand it, for example, let's say a child is swinging on a swing and they're going at whatever rate it is, their natural frequency of swinging. If you want to make them swing faster, you actually have to time your pushes to their natural frequency. If you are pushing at a completely different rate than what they were swinging at, 
they won't swing faster, they'll actually come to a stop. So when you push them at the same rate at which they're going, you give them a force every time they come back to the apex of their swing and you're pushing at the same rate as their swing, that is resonance. That boosts how quickly uh, and how far they swing. So just you know, to, 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 to give us an analogy that we're familiar with. So based on these considerations and his calculations, Fred Hoyle, who happened to be visiting Caltech from Cambridge, did some calculations and figured carbon would have to have a natural energy level at 7.65 mega electron volts for resonance to take place. If beryllium and helium were to combine to make the amount of carbon we see, that would require resonance to boost the, that reaction rate. And that would mean, based on Hoyle's quantum mechanical calculations, that carbon would need to have a natural energy level at 7.65 mega electron volts. Well, that's great. The only problem is that the resonance level of carbon had already been mapped and there was no natural energy level at 7.65 mega electron volts. Hoyle went to a friend of his at Caltech named Willie Fowler and he convinced Willie Fowler that uh, by calculation this had to exist. Initially, Willie Fowler, well, the story goes, was a bit resistant, but he was finally convinced that, okay, let's get everybody together, let's get all the equipment, let's get all the people, let us start from the ground up and remeasure the nuclear energy levels of carbon 12. And lo and behold, it turned out that carbon 12 had a natural nuclear energy level at 7.656 mega electron volts, precisely where Hoyle had calculated. So the only way that there is enough carbon to support life here on Earth, to have a universe capable of producing us carbon-based life forms, and by us, I don't just mean humans, I mean life on Earth, Carbon needed a natural energy level at 7.65 mega electron volts. It turned out to have it hitherto undiscovered until Hoyle's theoretical calculations so that this phenomena of resonance could exist and facilitate and boost beryllium-8 joining helium-4 to make carbon-12. So that is the story of the magic of carbon synthesis. Now, to put things in uh, some perspective, what happens if when we add the energy levels of two nuclei plus their kinetic energy, it is not near a natural energy level of what would be their compound nucleus, or if the energy is above the natural energy levels, then they do not stick together to make that compound nucleus. They may stick together momentarily, but then they will immediately be spit back out and we would not be able to make a stable compound nucleus. And so it turns out that these energies of beryllium-8 and helium-4 plus the kinetic energy they have from floating around uh, or moving around quickly in a hot star are near a natural energy level for carbon-12. and um, this is what happens if things are not near a natural energy level, just to contrast it with the previous diagram. And so this was how Hoyle discovered the needed resonance in carbon-12. And this is indeed a phenomena of fine tuning. But the story doesn't end there because we can ask, well, great, but then now that I've made carbon-12, why don't I just grab another helium nucleus or another helium nucleus can bump into carbon-12, well, what would that make? That would make oxygen-16, the form of oxygen that we know. So why is it that carbon sticks around in stars, enough carbon to subtend life? Why doesn't the same process that made carbon from beryllium and helium make oxygen from carbon and helium 
uh, and that all of the carbon would simply be used up because it would go into making oxygen. And this is actually another miracle of fine tuning because it turns out that that reaction, if this were carbon 12 and this were another helium nucleus, it is not resonant. It cannot make oxygen quickly. Oxygen synthesis does not get the boost of resonance because it turns out that these combined energy levels are just above the resonance level of the natural energy level in the oxygen nucleus. And so all of our carbon does not get burned up making oxygen. And that is how carbon is saved. There's a resonance that helps in producing carbon, but an absence of resonance that keeps all of that carbon from then being turned into oxygen. Okay, let's look at this process numerically now so that we can appreciate how finely tuned it is. Resonance exists for the synthesis of carbon from beryllium and helium. And when we look at the energies of beryllium and helium together, we get 7.367 mega electron volts. We throw in some kinetic energy of motion of these nuclei, and it gets it right onto the natural energy level of carbon of 7.656 mega electron volts, and carbon synthesis gets this magical boost so that we can make the carbon that life needs. But now, if I take carbon-12, for example, plus helium, and I look at their energies plus the kinetic energy, well, carbon plus helium, their energy sum is 7.162 mega electron volts. The relevant energy level for oxygen is 7.119 mega electron volts. These two together, without even any kinetic energy, are already just a little bit greater than the natural energy level for oxygen. So there is no resonance boost to making oxygen from carbon and helium. And so the presence of a resonance boost makes the carbon that we see possible for carbon synthesis. And the absence of a resonance boost keeps that carbon around and preserves it, preserves it from all being burned up and turned into oxygen. And that is how there is both enough carbon and enough oxygen for the delicate balance of life in this universe. Okay, if you remember, I had said that we would uh, use this story of the magic of carbon synthesis as a segue into the fine tuning of the forces of nature. So far, I haven't mentioned the forces of nature. Well, we've been talking about these natural energy levels in the nuclei. Well, what sets those? Why are those levels what they are in each particular nucleus? And it turns out that this is a very delicate and very complex interaction between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force. And that interaction is what makes the levels what they are, given the number of protons and neutrons in a particular nucleus. Those calculations could not be made precisely at the time that Fred Hoyle discovered the resonance level. Enough was there for him to calculate what the resonance level for carbon needed to be. But what would happen if these forces were varied just a little bit? That could not be calculated. That came years later. And here is now a graph. And the bottom line of this graph, here are the abundances, the predicted abundance versus the observed abundance. A curve for carbon, a curve for oxygen, and the variations in the strong nuclear force and the variations in the electromagnetic force. And here is where we are in our universe. On the bottom line, so that we don't have to spend a lot of time on this graph, is that if the strong nuclear force were to vary by just 
0.4%, 0.2% above or 2% below, or if the electromagnetic force were to vary by just 4%, 2% below or 2% above, either we would have a universe that was essentially all carbon or a universe that was essentially all oxygen, but we would not have the balance required for life that we do have. This is a perfect example of fine tuning of the forces of the universe with a very, very small tolerance of variation. And remember, these forces can vary on the order of millions and millions and millions of times what they are. So the strong nuclear force is much, much, much stronger than the electromagnetic force by many orders of magnitude. So when we say that there's a tolerance of 0.4% or 4%, that is an amazing amount of fine tuning, given that we have no idea why the electromagnetic force is not a million times stronger than, than what it currently is. We just measure what it is as part of the fabric of nature. And this is what led uh, John Gribben and Martin Rees. And Martin Rees also was director of the Institute of Astronomy at Cam Cambridge University for many years, world famous astrophysicist, to make this statement, that this combination of coincidences, just right for the resonance of carbon-12, just wrong for oxygen-16, is indeed remarkable. There is no better evidence to support the argument that the universe has been designed for our benefit, tailor-made for man. So this is why we study this stuff. For those who get bored that we go into this sort of detail, I don't think we can appreciate a statement like this unless we go into the detail. So I sincerely hope that you appreciate this as, as much as I do or more than I do uh, and are not bored by the detail that we're going into. And that going into this level of detail gives us a different level of appreciation and awe when we come across a Quranic verse like this, إِنَّ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقْنَاهُ بِقَدَرْ with which we started this lecture, that verily all things we created in proportion and measure, and we have just seen a little bit of that measure and its finesse. And I hope that we looked at this verse at the beginning of the lecture, we've now looked at it at the end of the lecture, I do hope that there is now a little bit more awe and a little bit more appreciation of what this means. And we have looked at only one very, very tiny sliver of this proportion and this measure. Take care, God bless, and hopefully, inshallah, you will join us for the next lecture where we will dig deeper now into the fine tuning of the forces of nature. Assalamu alaikum.